Um, we talk a lot about John the Baptist this time of year, uh, and uh, who, who knows something? What do you know about John the Baptist? Anything? What do you know? Yeah, baptized Jesus. What else? His mother was Elizabeth, but so what? Mary's cousin, a relative. So, so John the Baptist and Jesus were relatives of some kind. I'm not exactly sure. Lived in the wilderness. Uh, why? He, 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 was, he did that on purpose because he was trying to present himself as um, a return of the great prophet Elijah. And in that, in that idea, people recognized him as that. He was then carrying a message of repentance, telling people uh, that they needed to repent. Do you know why he said people needed to repent? What was it he said was about to happen? Do you know? Yes, he was preparing for the, the Messiah, the chosen one, God's anointed one, the one, the Savior, whoever it was going to be. He was trying to get people ready for that, saying that if you didn't get yourself spiritually ready, you wouldn't recognize the Christ when he came. And that is why we talk about John the Baptist at the time of Advent, which is a time of spiritual preparation. So he was constantly working on that idea, um, trying to get people to recognize that that was what they needed to do. Um, and then he unlocked his iPad and remembered what he wanted to say. So he talked about confession and he talked about repentance. How do you like the sound of those words? If I told you today is to be a service of confession and repentance, how do you feel? Pretty yeah, pretty happy. <laughs> right. Is there anyone here with anything to confess and repent of? Yeah. So we tend to think of them as negative things, but they're not. Um, and in John the Baptist's mind, I doubt that they were either. They're hard, but they're not necessarily bad because confession doesn't mean admitting all the things you did wrong. Confession means to face the situation as it is, to look at yourself as you really are, to see yourself for the person that you really are, and stop pretending. And repentance has a specific meaning. Does anybody know what repentance specifically means? Well, yes, and that's why it goes, that's exactly why it goes with confession, because confession is facing up to what the situation is, and the repentance is then giving up on that. Um, about face. Um, it, it means literally to stop and to turn around and go the other way. That's the literal meaning of the word repentance in the Bible. It means you're going this way. It means to come to a stop, turn around completely, and go the other way. And um, that's why, and the reason you would do that, why would you do a thing like that? Because you're driving down the wrong side of the highway. And if you're on the wrong side of the highway, does it make sense to keep going? Of course not. You've got to stop and turn around and go the other way. Now, that's hard. Am I right? To make a turn like that, to make a change in your life that complete, to completely reverse the direction of your life, that is not an easy thing to do. And, I, and I'm not going to pretend that it is. But at the other hand, it's not bad news. It's good news because that's what saves us sometimes, that move from going one direction to going the other one. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what that might mean. Let's go back. I've got, uh, how many more? One, two, three, four, five, six more things to talk about. So um, pick one, pick a topic, and we'll hit it. Suzanne? Eating worms. Why do people eat worms? <laughs> On a dare? Because they're hungry? That might be it. Who knows the song? What's the song, Susan? Yeah, nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I guess I'll go eat worms. And that is one of the things that we, when we're in that situation, we need to get repentance of and to turn around. When we get to that point in our lives where we begin to think that nobody loves us, nobody cares for us, everybody hates us, then it's time to turn around. I was talking to a young man this past week who was feeling that very much, um, feeling like he had failed everybody and consequently came to the conclusion that there was nobody in the world that cared about him, that he was 
all by himself in the world. Now he wasn't. He's a very likable person. He's married and he's got a, a wife who loves him and cares about him. He's got family that loves him and cares about him. But at that moment, because of his perspective, because of the way he was thinking, he felt as if he was unloved, completely unloved in the world. Nobody loved him. He wasn't actually eating worms, but that's because it's winter and there aren't any. He might have done it. I don't know. But in the same sense, we kind of feed ourselves stuff like that when we are feeling bad about ourselves, feeling low on ourselves, and feeling that nobody cares about us. One of, the story, one of the things that we offer at a church is this idea that that just simply is not true, that you are dearly beloved and dearly cared for, and you don't need to eat worms. As a matter of fact, we offer uh, bread and wine here that is filled with goodness and love and peace and hope. So that's one of the things, if you're at a point in life where you are sitting there thinking, nobody loves me, nobody cares about me, then it's time to confess that, say it, admit it, and turn around and go the other way and recognize that you are probably surrounded by a great many people who love you and care for you. All right, let's see. Next one. The dude gets needled. What did Jesus say about a needle? Easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than a rich person to get into heaven. Um, do yourself a favor, friends. Don't take that literally. But recognize what Jesus is saying. He, who did he say this to? Do you know? Anyone know? Yeah. They had a rich man. I, uh, uh, sometimes they'd say a young man. A rich man who came to Jesus and said... I want to get into the kingdom of heaven, just like you say. I want to. How do I do it? What do I have to do? And Jesus says, keep the commandments. And the young man says, I've done all of that. I've kept all of the commandments from the day I was born. And then Jesus, it says, Jesus looked at him and he loved him. And he said to him, you only need to do one more thing. Now, doesn't that sound like a great start? Don't you like that idea? Somebody says to you, only one more thing. Just, we just need one more thing. All you have to do is sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Then come and follow me. Did he do it? Well, we don't know. What we do know is he didn't do it right away, anyhow, because he walked away feeling very sad. And that's when Jesus said, oh, see, it's harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich dude like this to get into the kingdom of heaven. Which is like, yes, Tom. He, yeah, and he may have Tom, but the question then is, can a camel get through that needle's eye? No, he still can't. So it doesn't make any difference. It might as well be right this size. As a matter of fact, when I was over there in Jerusalem, uh, we went into the church of the nativity where Jesus was, you know, the church that's over the site where Jesus was born. You remember the size of the door, Ann? The, the doors were only about this wide and this high, and you had to bend over to get in, and they said the reason for that it was to keep the soldiers from riding their horses right into the church. So uh, there's something to it. But what, what Jesus, the point Jesus was making, of course, was that this young man's going to have trouble getting into the realm of heaven because he's got all this stuff he's trying to bring with him. Now, what do you think are the chances that you, dollar for dollar, have a lot more money than that rich guy back then? You know you do, right? Did he have a cell phone? He did not. Did he have a car? He did not. Did he have four pairs of shoes? Probably not. Um, by our standards, he was probably still poor. So what is Jesus saying to us about all that we have? Are we in danger from that? And the question I have to ask myself is, what, what would I struggle to give up if I had to give it up? Um, and we're looking at the news out of Aleppo today. And what do those people have to give up just to stay alive? Everything. Everything. And yet we get worried when we have to cut back our budget for some reason. And, and I'm, I'm not pointing any fingers because I'm guilty of that myself. We get so used to being able to have all we want um, that we get addicted to it. And it becomes a danger for it. And wouldn't it feel good if you could say, I don't need that. I can let that go. 
I don't need that. I can let that go. I don't need this. I could let this go. How would that feel if suddenly you were able to say, I don't need all this? You could confess that and you could repent. <laughs> Lighter. <laughs> all right, let's see. Let me get back to where I was. What else? The red lizard. Uh, in the book The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis, some of us studied that book back in the spring, uh, these uh, people come from hell and take a bus to go to heaven and they can stay if they want to or they can get back on the bus and go back to hell. But when they get to heaven, they find out they're not quite real. They're kind of like ghosts. And one of the ghosts uh, is talking to an angel that's trying to encourage him to come into heaven and the ghost has a red lizard perched on his shoulder. And the lizard keeps whispering to him and talking to him. And the angel says, you can come into heaven, but as long as you have that lizard on your shoulder, you are never going to be real enough to be able to get into heaven. And uh, the, the lizard keeps whispering to the guy in his ear. And sometimes the guy laughs, and sometimes it makes him mad. But what he comes to realize is he really wants to get rid of that thing, but he, but he doesn't want to get rid of that thing. He loves it. He hates it. He loves it. He hates it. The lizard sits there on his shoulder and won't let him go. And the angel, he says, I can't let go of the lizard. It'll kill me. And the angel says, I can get rid of the lizard, <coughs> and it won't kill you. So the man finally says, I do want to let it go. I want to let it go. I want to go to heaven. I want to let it go. And the angel reaches over and grabs the lizard, and the man screams, it burns, it burns, it hurts. And the angel says, I didn't say it wouldn't hurt. I said it wouldn't kill you. And he takes the lizard off and kills it, throws it aside. And the man then begins to change from a ghost into a real person and is able to go into heaven after that. So the question is, what's the red lizard? What is your red lizard? What is the thing that sits on your shoulder and keeps you from moving forward into a deeper and more real faith or a deeper and more real life? What might some examples of what is that lizard is, what might it be? I'm not saying for you, but what might that symbolize? One thing sounds really clear to me. A crutch, an addiction of some kind. Um, it's a lizard on your shoulder instead of a monkey on your back, but uh, uh, those kind of things can get in the way. And those are things that we can confess and repent of and leave behind. What's the first step in Alcoholics Anonymous? Recognize you've got to have a problem. Uh, you're, you have a problem, and that is confession. And then you begin to follow the steps through, and that's the process of repentance, to turn away from that. What's sitting on your shoulder, whispering in your ear, that is keeping you from moving forward? You could let that go and be free from that. That's what John the Baptist is asking of you. Let's well, so say at least one, maybe two more. This is Elijah again. Remember Elijah? John the Baptist is trying to look like Elijah. Elijah has gotten into a conflict with King Ahab. You know who Ahab is, right? The guy that was trying to kill Moby Dick? All right, well, the reason, the reason he named, the reason Melville named that captain Ahab was because Ahab was as bad of a person as he could think of in the Bible. Ahab was a pretty evil tyrant. And Elijah had run into a conflict with him and had come to conclude that he was going to be killed. And off he went into the desert to hide. And he eventually went to a cave. And he, he had run as far as he could go. He was hiding out there uh, in that cave thinking this. I have been abandoned. I have been left. Nobody follow, cares about God anymore. And God has left me behind. I'm stuck out here. And nobody is on my side and everybody wants to kill me. It's another variation. There were no worms in the desert, or he'd have been eating them. Um, he was out there, and he felt that he was all alone in the world. His doubt about what God was doing just overwhelmed him. It overwhelmed him so much that he went from this powerful voice who was ready to stand up to a king to hiding in a cave in the desert. And he went out there, and what he heard was just a small voice, just the slightest sound of a voice all by himself and the voice said to him Elijah what are you doing here Elijah what are you doing here and what was Elijah doing there hiding 
feeling sorry for himself, feeling discouraged and depressed, feeling as if he was all alone in the world. And the voice said to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah let it all come out. And you can read this story in the Bible if you want to. He let it out. He said all that he wanted to say. He said how he was alone in the world. Nobody cared about what he was trying to do. He let all of that go. And when he let all of that go, then God's answer to him was, go back. You have more work to do. God didn't promise to solve the problem. God didn't promise to stop King Ahab. God didn't promise to make people listen. God just said, Elijah, you got to go back. What are you doing here? You can't accomplish anything here. You got to go back. Doubt and despair and discouragement hold us back. And when we feel it, doubt, despair, discouragement, we have to do two things. What's the first one? Starts with a C. Confess. Admit it. Don't pretend it's not true. And the second thing? Repent. And go the other way. One more. One more. What's left? This one's a tough one. This is a dangerous one, so you may not want to listen. Um, I quit a job doing that. Buffing floor. Oh, I'm pointing here, but it's there. Buffing floors in a building in downtown Boston. I eventually had to quit. Now, I had a bunch of reasons for it, but I had one overwhelming reason for why I quit. The overwhelming reason, it was a part-time job. I was working four hours a day, five days a week. They were playing Muzak overhead. Not music, you understand, Muzak. And they had a three-hour long tape. And that meant that every day I heard the same music and some of it twice every day. And eventually, I couldn't stand it another minute. It was killing me. I actually attempted to squirt my cleaning fluid into the speakers in the ceiling to see if I could make the music stop. One time I just hung up my machine and went looking around the building trying to find the source of the music so I could turn it off. But it wouldn't stop every day. And every day, at least, twi or at least once, I had to hear Whiter Shade of Pale played by the London Philharmonic or something, you know. Do, 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 do. So I quit. Best thing I ever did. Well, maybe not. I quit that job in part because of that. Also, the boss was an alcoholic, so there was that problem too. Have you ever had a job that wore you down and made you smaller and less? I see smirking all over the place. Have you ever had one of those jobs where they made you small and weak or, or depressed and discouraged or overwhelmed or you were overworked and underpaid? Anybody besides me? Yeah, okay. Have you ever considered the fact that you might have to make a change like that? Change the place you work or the place you live or the place you go to school, whatever it might be. Make that kind of a change. Now, most of the time, changes like that don't help. If you, are the, if you are having a problem at work and you go to another place and you have the same problem at work and you go to another place and you have the same problem, guess where the problem lies? It's not work. Yeah. But sometimes it makes a difference. Sometimes you have to make that change. Sometimes a relationship has to change. Sometimes a location has to change. Sometimes an activity has to change. And maybe Advent is the time to think about that, about admitting that and repenting from it. And then the last one. We do this, don't we? We get into destructive behavior. We do things that hurt ourselves, um, from diet and no exercise to all kinds of other things. There's a story in the Bible where uh, there's a man, they say he's demon-possessed. Today he would say, we would say he was psychotic who lived out into the, he, he lived in the town cemetery among the tombs, um, ran around naked half the time. And one of the interesting things it says that he did was he picked up sharp stones and he cut himself. And in our society, we totally understand that because that's a thing that happens mostly with young people, um, not just girls, boys do this too, but people who cut themselves because uh, it's hard to understand exactly why, but it, just the hurt of that makes them feel like maybe they're alive still. That's pretty hurtful. There are all kinds of destructive behaviors that we get into. Mostly here in our church, we are people who don't do too much of that. But there are among us still those who do have uh, destructive behaviors in our own lives. 
And I'm not looking at anybody. I hope I make eye contact with people. I'm not looking at you because I think you're one of those. I'm just saying we all know something about this, don't we? About destructive behaviors. And wouldn't it feel good to leave that behind? To let that go? And this is what I'm saying. The call, call to repentance is good news. The call to confess and repent is good news because all it is is leaving behind stuff you don't want to have in the first place. Let it go. Leave it be. You don't need it. Put it aside. Move away from it. Turn around. Go the other direction. That's our call today. You've been listening to a sermon by Rev. Stephen Carnahan, pastor of High Street Congregational Church in Auburn, Maine. If you feel inspired by what you hear, we invite you to join us in person for worship services every Sunday morning, beginning at 10 o'clock. Of course, you can always listen to Steve's sermons on the web. New sermons are posted every Monday by midday. Please take a moment to explore this website for more information about our church or visit our Facebook page at High Street Congregational Church, comma, UCC. We hope that God's presence will be known to you every hour of every day. And that God's blessings will rest upon you now and always. See you next week.